Welcome back. This week we'll be looking at indigenous history. Uh, before we get into Chicano history, we spent a few weeks focusing on uh, Mexico for the most part. We'll talk about a little, little bit about Spain, uh, but kind of challenge some of the ideas that have been presented throughout time about indigenous culture. So we're going to talk there, uh, talk about this first, and uh, next week we'll talk about um, our other side, which is our Spanish side, looking at Spain. Um, so part of the reason why we do this is because of the way Mexican Americans have been defined. Um, during the Zoot Suit riots, um, during that period, there was a court case called the Sleepy Lagoon. And during that trial, there was a anthropologist giving testimony about why uh, these Mexican Americans killed each other at, at this particular case. And he argued um, that it was because it's in our blood, that it is almost instinct that we like to to shanky each other, right, with a with a razor blade or something, uh, making the point that we, by nature, are violent uh, due to our indigenous past, due to our Indian blood, if you will, and and that's very <clears throat> very problematic, right? It's very racism. We already kind of address those type of issues about how race is kind of formed. Um, but uh, when people make statements such as those, I mean, that's just one, but there's many, many more, we have to kind of go back as as, um, as a people and say, well, what's our real history, right? So I'm going to give you an overview of Mexican American history. Well, there's so much more and uh, you can take a Mexican history class to fully cover some of this material or even a uh, um, you know, Aztec history class. You can, you can take a whole semester on this material, um, but we're going to connect it to our Chicano culture. All right, so this is significant in that context. And we're finally going to address also the rise and fall of Aztec society. So I'm going to try to go through this quick. It might be like half an hour. We'll see. But um, normally it's much longer in class. Uh, and I have to omit some videos that I typically show just because we just don't don't have the time in the online class to to show you this stuff. All right, kind of some short clips. So before we begin uh, getting into that indigenous history, um, I, I first want to talk about the um, the rise of why Mexican Americans go back to indigenous history. If this class had been offered 90 years ago, the professor probably would have never talked about the indigenous past. And if anything, they would probably would have ignored it because there would have been a sense of shame. So it is significant that we talk about it, particularly in the post 1960s. All this will make sense as we move forward as to why I'm making these statements. So after the 1960s, we have the civil rights movement, right? It's, it's a period where um, ethnic minorities uh, begin to challenge the notion that we are part of this bigger melting pot, where you have more or less uh, white America saying, why don't these people just assimilate, right? Why, why don't they just become like the rest of us? You know, these black people, these brown people, these Asian people, why, why not just be American, right? Why not just call yourself American? Well, understand that there's a lot of racism, you know, uh, things like Jim Crow were used against Mexican Americans, African Americans, and even Asian Americans, right? Uh, along with other groups, right? Uh, so yes, we wanted to fit in. We wanted to be part of that melting pot, but society never allowed us to be part of that melting pot. Up to the 1960s, Mexican Americans could not move into white neighborhoods. It was actually illegal for some of them to move into these places. So it's not that we didn't want to be part of this bigger idea of America, is that we were not allowed to. And this is what mainstream society just quite doesn't understand. And they feel like, well, you know, my family came from Ireland, from Italy, from Germany, and they blended in. Well, it's a whole different history. Yes, they might have experienced discrimination, but it was never systemic. You know, by a generation, they were able to to melt into this idea of, you know, the, the American, into the American dream. With us, because of the color of our skin or the way that we looked, we were never allowed to do this. So looking at our indigenous past and looking at courses like Chicano history, um, uh, we, we, we kind of have to go back and look at these 
um, historical events to see how it kind of shaped us to develop a class like this. Uh, just a quick side note, I had one student, Anglo-American student, who, who took my, who took this class, well, actually not this one, a Chicano history class, and he took a European history class. And when he was taking my Chicano history class, he said, why is it that there's no white history? And, you know, I think that this is unfair. And, and I, I remember telling him, um, I can't say his name, but um, I told him, hey, you know, you were in my, in my European history class. I'm like, didn't you get enough white people there? You know, that's all I talked about were a bunch of dead white people and a bunch of dead white men. So I'm like, how much more white people do you want me to talk about? You know, I'm like, you got my, and I started running, you know, through all these courses that I teach. I'm like, you know, we got history 100, dead white people. You, know, you got history 101, history 102, history 103, history 104, history 108, right? History 201, history 178. And I name all these kind of courses that we actually offer at EMCC. I'm like, you know, you can take all that and learn so much. I'm like, and we only get one, right? We get one Chicano studies class. And that's the only time we ever talk about Mexican Americans and, and, and then we forget about them. So it, it's funny how, you know, there's a sense of, of even a, a bit of an arrogance of like, well, what about us, uh, white America? You know, where, where's our history? It's like, oh my God, there's just so much of it. And we just get one class and, and, and there's a sense that we're taking over, right? Um, so that's what makes it so funny. Uh, so sorry to go on that rant, but, uh, um, it's just, this is why these classes are important. You know, we get one chance to do it and hopefully we do it right. And, um, you know, hopefully you walk out learning something. Uh, another thing is that uh, a class like this challenges the idea that only Europeans are civilized throughout history. And, and really up to the 1960s, uh, maybe even into the seventies, you know, it was only Europeans were the people who were actually uh, perceived that as being civilized. The rest of us were uncivilized, right? African uh, peoples and, and so forth, right? Asian peoples and obviously Latin, um, Native Americans. <clears throat> so a, co a course like this challenges that perspective. And, and we're going to show some of the great, uh, not only artifacts, but some of the great civilizations in Mesoamerica, particularly in Mexico, that, you know, we're probably way ahead of of Europeans at the same time. And then lastly, a class like this creates this kind of unifying heritage. So yeah, we're not all descended from Aztecs, right? We're not all Aztec princes and princesses. Um, you know, we're Zapotec and Mayan and, and so forth, right? Um, but it, it allows us to come together. We, when I talk about identity construction, right? This is a great example of that, how a history that might not be, you know, connected to us directly through through bloodline. Nevertheless, um, connects us all through a shared experience, right? So um, these classes and classes, whether it be Black history or Asian American uh, studies or, or even women's history and, and Chicano studies, definitely it creates a sense of, you know, we we number one we matter, and number two that we do have a long history that connects us to the land that we sit on. So in the 1960s, you have this kind of birth of what's called Chicano nationalism. We'll talk about this more later, uh, I think after the midterm, <clears throat> of, of this sense of pride, because prior to this period, Mexican-Americans were taught that it was shameful to be Mexican, that it was, uh, like I said earlier, it was you know disgusting that we were dirty and so forth. So for the first time, we were like, no, we're proud of our heritage. We're proud of our past. We're proud of our parents, and and we could you know hold our heads high, and talk about you know some of the great achievements of our people. <clears throat> That's why I said like in the 1920s, many Mexican Americans were trying to assimilate, and and they probably would have said, yeah, you know we're we're not very proud of those Native American people in our, in our family tree or something like that. In the 1960s, we began to get, you know, begin to be proud of that. I mean, in the 1920s, Mexican Americans are trying to bleach their skin, you know, and we still see things like that today where I think in India, they, they sell bleaching cream so Indian people can look whiter. Uh, Mexican Americans were doing the same thing in the 1920s. So the sense of shame with being dark, having black hair, right? Um, looking, having like indigenous features in 1960s, 
we we let go of that and we begin to be proud of who we are. And then um, you know it links us to it links today to the past, right? That we are connected um, to these historical events that shape our identity today. So it definitely uh, you know, this concept of Chicanismo, and there's problems with the term itself too. And, and you know, when we talk about the 1960s, we'll talk about the problem of Chicanismo. But uh, at the, you know, in, in the context of the 1960s, it definitely created a sense of pride in our past. So let's uh, dig into this stuff. So now let's look at uh, Mesoamerica. And we begin by looking at ancient civilization. So this is around the time, um, you know, uh, probably when the Greeks are around in Europe, um, Native people in the America in the Americas are developing these kind of civilizations, and and you have to understand that the word civil uh, civilization is connected to um, Western civilization. So this is why we always perceive as uncivilized. It's actually I think a Latin word that the Romans used, uh, used to define themselves when they compare themselves to the uh, to the barbarians, right? <clears throat> so. Uh, Mesoamerican people throughout time um, have been viewed as uncivilized. Yet we see that, you know, they begin to develop fields. They begin to develop great arts, as you see here, right? We see ceramic figures, which are all elements of civilization. I think by the nineteen hundreds or nineteen, can't remember, somewhere around the early twentieth century, the word civilization begins to kind of evolve to begin to include other groups of people. Um, and this civilization is, is very significant to note because unlike Western culture where you're supposed to dominate nature, um, and if you ever study you know, uh, ancient civilization and things like the Bible and things like that, you see that um, people kind of look at these religious texts and they explain to them that, they're, that nature was created for them to dominate, right? That nature is theirs for the taking. Whereas in Mesoamerica, it's quite the opposite, which is probably a better relationship to have with nature, is that nature is there to provide for you, but you also have to take care of it, right? I know it sounds a little bit environmentalist, and maybe they were the first environmentalists, um, because Mother Earth gives you life, right? So you can't disrespect it. So they're definitely very dependent on agriculture, these early Mesoamerican civilizations that were around 4,000 years ago. Um, and it's the gods who are constantly giving you substance. This is why the priests are very important in these civilizations. <clears throat> and they hold almost a mystical, super, um, supernatural power over civilizations. Um, but as I noted, right, it, it's, it's a very different perspective from Western culture. In Western culture, it's about want, 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 gimme, gimme, gimme. You know, let me exploit the resources that are given to me by this, by this planet. Whereas in Mesoamerican cultures, more than like, no, I, it's it's a give and take, right? Yes, um, I need these this substance, but I also have to respect the earth um, because it's you know it's the gods who are giving me these things. So we look at some of the early civilizations. Uh, we begin most. Textbooks do this in Chicano history. We begin by looking at the Olmecs, one of the early civilizations that were established um, in the area of Veracruz, uh, Tabasco, which is kind of like in the um, Yucatan area, you know, kind of southern, eastern Mexico. And you know, here you see some of the artifacts that they develop. And you begin to, you know, they're known as like the first kind of mother culture, mother civilization. Um, because they kind of set up the structure for other Mesoamerican cultures that developed after that. So they had the ball courts, and I'll talk about that. <clears throat> they had a drainage system. So they're developing cities, right? And they had these kind of colossal, colossal stone heads, as you see here. One thing that stands out about these heads, if you look at the facial feature, they almost look like African peoples, right? And, you know, some people, and this is all... Um, you know, just kind of theories that are out there, but people have maybe arguments based on certain artifacts is that maybe African people were the first people to arrive to the Americas way before 
the Europeans did based on you know, kind of archaeological and some of these physical features that we see here. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, these are great monuments that they created. They also develop um, trade throughout Mesoamerica, kind of spreading out their culture into other regions into Mexico, which is why so many borrow from them. And they are the first to develop a written language. Uh, they found a, kind of a cylinder, ceramic um, cylinder, where it had all this um, kind of language written on it. So. It's, it's quite important because these are some of the elements that you need to define the concept of civilization. You know, obviously having the city, having gods, priests, having language, having a political system. All this was being done by the Olmecs, um, you know, close to 1500 years. Um, actually, more than 1500 years, um, 3500 years uh, ago. Another important period that we look at is the Mesoamericans, uh, sorry, the Mayans, sorry about that, um, in Mesoamerica. Uh, and their society, we see that they have this development of, of knowledge, you know, they have a precise um, system in, in tracking the, the stars, not so much because they're great, you know, they, they want to study the, the, the universe, but rather because they need to know when to plant things. So they need to understand the concept of time. Today, you look at your watch, <coughs> sorry, you look at your watch, you look at a, your phone and you see the calendar, what date we're on, right? You don't think about those things too much. But imagine if all that information was gone and you just you know, pop your head outside and say, well, what day is it today? Is it Monday? Is it Saturday? I mean, some of us feel like that right now with the, with the whole, um, COVID thing going on right now, right? We don't know where the other week we're, we're in. Um, but these things are, this is important information to know when you're going to plant because you need to prepare for the, for the future because if you don't, you're gonna be without food in the winter, right? So they were great um, astronomers and mathematicians because they needed to know when to, to harvest, when to grow stuff. <clears throat> so this information made them great uh, scientists for that era. They also had no use of metal. Everything that they used, all their tools, were chipped out of, uh, made out of stone, where they just kind of chipped it away. And, you know, far from um, popular belief, we find that the Mayan actually had knowledge of the wheel. We see it here. This is an artifact of the Mayans, um, and they had the, the wheel. But they never put it to any kind of practical use. They actually just used it for um, uh, for toys. This is what what this is. It's a Mayan toy. Uh, they had cities with like the Olmecs, right? The ball courts, uh, great pyramids. Um, they had actually apartment complexes, you know, town centers, major avenues, <clears throat> structure in a way that kind of like Phoenix in very perpendicular formats, where it makes it conducive towards um, business, right? Um, markets and things like that. And they had a, a infrastructure, um, again, sewers and streets and things like that, that allowed them to um, create these great cities. And um, they made the cities beautiful. You know, they, they painted and plastered them. Today you go to them and they're all kind of gray, made out of stone. But if you were to go back in time, they would have been plastered with great colors, like almost like a European city at that time. So as I mentioned, they had draining system, you know, um, a, a sewer um, system. Don't take my word for this, because this is something my professor told me in college. I think he was lying, but still kind of funny that um, when the Europeans arrived, not, not to this region, but to a different region, um, in the 1400s that they started fishing in these holes that they found where water ran through it and that the native people were just kind of dumbfounded by these Europeans because they were um, fishing in their toilets, <laughs> basically. So it just kind of again shows how advanced they were uh, compared to the to the Europeans at that time, right? Um, they had water channels. Water, water channels were very important because it helped them distribute goods um, into different parts of their territory. <clears throat> 
The ball courts were also very important because the ball courts um, were basically like a basketball slash soccer game that these people played. And it, 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 you know, you had to get a ball into a little hole, um, like a basketball, <clears throat> basketball hoop instead of this field that they had. And it, you know, the game itself is supposed to represent the gods, the deities, and, uh, at the end, whoever lost, they would sacrifice the, um, the captain of a losing team. And then the losing team will get some kind of punishment. So I always say, you know, we should bring those that format back to the Mexican national team and maybe we'll, we'll win the World Cup or something. All right, the, uh, we're going to continue by looking at the Mayans. Their capital was in uh, Petén. And as I said earlier, you know, they had great scientific knowledge. They developed the concept of zero without European um, contact, right? They, they develop it um, on their own. And they develop it because they need it. They need to know this information in order to do these kind of great mathematical and astrological studies that they're doing at that time. So again, this doesn't make them uncivilized, quite the opposite. It's, they're, they're much more civilized than the Europeans because they get the concept of zero from, from Arabs. They couldn't develop it themselves. They had a calendar that was much more exact than the European calendar at this time. You know, it was close to what we have, 365 days, more or less, um, unheard of at this time. They actually also did things like brain surgery. They found that um, there was simple brain surgery happening in the Mayan region. You know, they tracked the stars <clears throat> in order for them to predict the future. And they had this kind of blood ritual <clears throat> Uh, particularly the, the, the priests, you know, the, the emperor priests of these civilizations, because um, they were seen as deities, as gods, and they were important to each community because they, they had that close relationship with the gods. So when they did this blood ritual, they, they would um, shed blood from different parts of their bodies uh, the most painful one was was this one. I wonder if I have a video. I want to show you this video, and then um, see what you all think of this process. I want to. Been up there. Uh, uh, this, this is a is stingray, stingray spine. spine. And bloodletting was a big part of the Maya culture. Now, if you see the stinger, you'll see that there are bars that go backwards. And basically, if you want to please the gods, well, you have to stick this in the male genitalia. Obviously, it did not come back out. It pushed it all the way through. The gods were mostly with blood from genitalia, dripped on paper, then burned so they could inhale the smoke. This this connection, connection between, between, the between the forest and the ground, and the ground beneath it. Ah, let me get out of this. So hopefully that video showed up. If it didn't, then I'll, I'll put it. Um, you could, it's, it's only less than a minute. Uh, let's look at the, the fall, and then I'll, I'll take a quick break, and then we'll come back and look at the Aztecs. So the fall of the Mayans, we see that uh, there are many factors to it. It was a great empire, but you know there was a, a drought that obviously made food resources scarce. There were uh, other tribes, um, kind of like the, the Roman Empire, right? As it begins to collapse, other groups want a piece of the pie too. So other uh, nomadic tribes were attacking the Mayans. So their food supplies was short, as I mentioned earlier, with the drought. The, uh, the population was increasing, so it, it puts, uh, kind of extends the empire of its resources. And then lastly, you have crop failure and soil exhaustion, just because you have so many people, so many mouths to feed. And the empire, the empire begins to kind of collapse and uh, fragment, if you will. So you still see Mayan people around, but just, you know, in smaller communities and different regions. And then some of them migrate into different parts of, of Mexico. All right. So we'll stop it there. And the next group we'll talk about is the Aztec.